What's another way to refute Calvinism? Universal gospel preaching, Chafer says, in preaching the gospel, should those who believe in the doctrine of election avoid offering salvation to all? Then you see a pastor. Okay, for all those who are not elect, shut up and listen. Don't say a word. This doesn't apply to you. Really. In Scripture, God discloses nothing whereby the elect can be distinguished from the non-elect. Well, the, 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 the non-elect wear bow ties, as both changes classes are unregenerate. You know, you were an unbeliever before you became a believer. Right? So don't hold yourself too high. In Scripture, think of others as better than yourself. In Scripture, God discloses nothing whether by the elect can be distinguished from the non-elect as both classes are unregenerate. Since a preacher of the gospel cannot know who is in his audience is elect, he is free to offer salvation to all without creating a problem for the non-elect. Even some elect persons may resist the claims of the gospel until the day of their death. Because the Bible affirms that Christ died for all, all can be offered the gospel without anyone attempting to determine whether they are elect or non-elect. It just monkeys up the works. It would just it would really turn people off if you start preaching Calvinism. That's why most Presbyterians just kind of evade that, or they say, well, yeah, just, just believe, okay. Uh, and they don't go into any detail. Wow, if you're not believing, you're going to hell anyway. Wow. That's awful to think of other people that way. So the gospel, which is to believe on the Lord Jesus until eternal life is to be presented to all men. Consistency and honesty, Chaver says, demand that the one who believes in limited atonement refrain from proclaiming God's universal offer of the good news of God's love and grace in Christ to all men indiscriminately, since in that view God did not extend grace to all, nor did Christ die for all. To tell all men that these things are true, that salvation is available to all, is a lie, if limited atonement is true. And it is not. As an exponent of limited atonement, one cannot answer truthfully the Philippian jailer's urgent question in Acts 16.30, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, well, you're not elect, so I'm not going to tell you. No, believe in the Lord Jesus. And you'll be saved, you and your family. If one answered as the scriptures say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, Acts 16.31, and the person is not elect, the answer would imply that the person could believe and be saved. But according to limited atonement advocates, God has made no provision for that non-elect person to be saved. Now let me just digress here. See, Jesus, they all go non-elect. They go to uh, limited atonement because uh, why would Christ make the effort to die for those who are not going to be saved? It's not your business. But he's gracious to all. Why would he only draw some and not others? It's not your business. Thank God he drew me. He chose me for the foundation of the world. Not because he knew I would or would not believe. That would make him sovereign. Because he's sovereign. He decrees what he will. Yet, incomprehensibly I choose to believe and that completely 100% corroborates God's sovereignty and his decrees and his election amazing what an amazing God we have don't think within the box that you can think of just remember in your resurrection body you will encounter a holy gracious and loving God and you'll you'll be awed Every day is there a day in, in eternity with the, the unbelievable capacity that he has and the unbelievable capacity that he's given you, superior to the angels. Hey, want to go to Saturn? Let's count the rings. If one answered as the scriptures say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, Acts 16, 31, and the person is not elect, the answer would imply that the person could believe and be saved. But according to limited atonement advocates, God has made no provision for that non-elect person to be saved. Yeah, God's limited, right? So the, the proper and honest answer would have to be, if God has chosen you to be saved, then all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Because most people say, you have to, yeah, then you have to justify yourself by doing some good works. And then people come out there, a lot of Christians in these charismatic churches, come out there with a measuring tape, measure the woman's skirt. I remember that when a girl wore a red, wore a red dress, there was a little bit above her knee. Not too much. That's conservative now. And, oh, she can't be Christian. We can't. We got to kick her out. Really? Stop 
to apply your own measuring tape to, your, uh, tape to yourself. So, so, but if God has chosen you, not chosen you, you, you don't have a prayer. You are lost and condemned forever, no matter what. God has chosen purposely to not provide salvation for you, even if you were to believe, which you cannot anyway. Wow. You are, in effect, a vessel of destruction. I wouldn't talk to people like that. Clearly, this people do, though. Clearly, this is not the gospel of salvation as evidenced in Scripture. Certainly, it is not good news to the whole world. God has made provision for all men to be saved. All men, were it not for his election, however, would still choose not to believe. Those whom God, by his grace alone, has in elected inevitably, will believe and be saved. It is not through any merit of the elect that they are chosen or that they do, do believe. Not even the effect that they choose to believe, chose to believe, for that very faith was given them to believe. Yet they chose of their own volition. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, yeah. So yet it is by the volition of the believer that he chose to believe. Incomprehensible stuff. No appeal is ever addressed to men that they should believe because they are already regenerated. It is rather that they should believe and receive eternal life. Now we have the doctrine that it is all to the glory of God whether an individual is saved or condemned permits the doctrine of unlimited atonement. Yeah. What if God choosing to show his wrath and make his power known bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory? Yet we chose of our own volition. Remember that. God is omnipotent. His purposes can never be defeated. Just as God created a perfect earth and then created perfect mankind to dwell on it in perfect harmony with him forever. But man's rebellion resulted in a change in this scenario such that now not all men will enjoy such an experience even though God had made provision for all men. So in the same way, God has provided for the salvation for all mankind, but in any any man's refusal to trust alone in Christ alone will deny him the opportunity to be saved and dwell with him forever. In neither case is God's plan thwarted, for this is precisely what he had decreed and what will occur. And in neither case, an angels are going to be in awe. Wait a minute, God, that's what you decreed. And you let man make his own choice. Yeah! And in neither case has God miscalculated, for it was all decreed, all was decreed by him to prove out that Given free will, look up on the letter index D for decrees. All was decreed by him to prove out that given free will will inevitably choose to rebel. So God is therefore justified in instituting a universe which is ruled totally under his sovereignty and no one else's. Not the angelic beings, no man's. Yet he'll co-rule with us once we're transformed into a resurrection body. Church age. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Noahic flood the failure of the Mosaic Law period, the evident failure of the church age, oh boy, and of all, I'm not proud to be part of this church age, and of all of God's sovereignly decreed dispensations have been prophesied to and will end in failure for this reason. Give you man, God gives you a chance. How many chances has he given the church? Or oh, mankind, period. Chaffer says, is God defeated if men are lost? This question relates to the larger question as to whether any sin or defiance of God means that God is defeated. Actually, the total process of people being saved or unsaved brings glory to God because it manifests his infinite attributes. There is no defeat for God because his purposes are being perfectly fulfilled even by the judgment on the lost in which his holiness and righteousness are revealed. Rejecting Christ and his redemption as every unbeliever does is anticipated in the plan of God. Though at the same time it is not according to the wishes of God who is benevolent in his relationship to all mankind. As stated in 2 Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In view that all men are saved by Christ's death for them is not supported in Scripture, for both the lost and the elect are equally regarded as unregenerate and unsaved until the individuals involved place their trust in Christ of their own free will. The doctrine of election <coughs> relative to salvation may better be comprehended if we understand that it is the infinite glory of God and the finite will of man which is simultaneously involved 
in man's eternal destiny. The scripture teaches that everything is to the glory of God, and it does. Romans 11, 36. For, far, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You know, you say, well, God gets all that glory and everything else. But how open is he? How loving is he? All mankind. He's not willing any should perish. How wondrous he drew me that I chose to believe. What a lonely kid I was. Madison Square Garden. I don't know what came over me. Billy Graham says, Come on down. Commit your life to Jesus and be saved. Commit your dive. I didn't want to go. You know why? I wanted to, but I knew it was futile. I can't promise to commit my life to live for Jesus at 17 years old or any age and make it stick. You don't make a fake promise or a promise you're not sure of. You gotta to be totally committed to commit. You have to be committed to commit, right? But you know what? If you commit to live for Jesus, you ought to be committed to a nut house. You can't commit your life to live for Jesus and make it stick. So I stayed back. Television cameras on that six hundred seat section in Madison Square Gardens on the upper deck. And uh I was so ashamed. They're gonna see me. You know, look at that. One kid. Everybody else left. They're all uh, the last part of the group. I see were leaving, and I didn't know where they were going. So I got out cowardly and followed them. But then I looked for a place to leave, to, to uh, just go out. I didn't know how to get home. I forgot where how to get home. I had no idea. I didn't even know where my seating section was. So how was I going to get back to my seating or go home? I didn't even have a nickel in my pocket. I didn't have my ticket in my pocket. And then this guy comes up to me and says, Robert? I looked at him and said, how'd you know my name? I said, your name tag. Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. 17 years old, you know. So he says, what are you, why are you over here? I said, I'm not, I'm not going to commit to live for Jesus. I can't. It's not honest. And the guy says, you're right. But Robert, you want to settle your eternity in heaven? Well, yeah, what, what do I do? He gave me John 3.16. Believe in the Lord Jesus. For God so loved the world, gave his one only son, whosoever believes should never perish, have everlasting life. He explained it, just like I explained it to people. I do it even better, though. I go into the Greek. And I'm so happy for that man to have come up to me. And he said, settle your eternity. Now that I knew I could do if he gave me the clue. And he did. Believe. And I did. And I was elated. I couldn't believe myself. At 17, I was so happy. I didn't care about school, girlfriends, boyfriends, well, the state of the world. All I cared for is, I'm going beyond this world, and I'm going to heaven with Jesus. Wow. Age 17. But so happy. I don't know. I think that was the Holy Spirit working in me. I went home and told my stepfather. Bad mistake. But it was the good thing to do. I didn't keep it to myself. I didn't want to. My mother, my sisters. Ah, oh, yeah, Rob. Okay, okay, okay. I'm glad so happy you, you know. And Pop told Mom to tell me. From now on, I'm putting carpet on the stairs. I can't stand you. You come down for dinner when Mother rings the dinner bell once. Get your meal. You go upstairs. Go to the attic to your room. And don't come back. Don't come down. You, you got one shot and that's it. I don't want you around the house. You're not part of this family anymore. You don't tell me about it being a Christian. I got my Norman Vincent Peale. What has he got now? He died. Wow. But I had my did. But he was nice to me later on. I mean, he gave me a, he paid part of my rent, got me a car, and uh, and then I couldn't pay for it, so job didn't pay for enough money. So uh, then he helped a little bit getting getting our house when I got married. So he turned over a new leaf, but uh, only so far. So, that was my life. But John 3.16, believe. That's it. So, Romans 11.36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I give God the glory for my salvation. I just so elated how he 
maneuver these things, set it up for me to learn the gospel. 